Grace to you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is enthroned on our praise. We lift Him high in worship, and in so doing, we ourselves are lifted to a higher place as we lift our eyes. I mean, so much of our life, our eyes are down at the problems, across from side to side, trying to get ahead and, and comparing ourselves against this and that. But when we lift our eyes to the high place where He is, we truly are lifted to a better place ourselves. So, grace to you and peace from God who has called us here together in worship. We are continuing on in our series. I've been saying that for 19 weeks. This is the 19th week in our series on the Christian basics, those things that we believe and we do, why we do them a certain way here, and, and, and how we do them here that's been this series. And uh, we've been kind of in a sub-series. Uh, last lesson we started a, uh, a discussion of worship. And we talked about that very particular question that the Churches of Christ uh, talk much about, a cappella music, instrumental music. We talked about that in the last lesson. Uh, but today I want to really talk to you about worship itself. The whole type of music question is really not too much about worship itself. Today, let's talk about what worship is. The heart and the essence of worship. What is worship? Why should we worship? And how can we worship? Those are the three questions you might see there on your outline in front of you if you have one. We spend so much of our time as a church in worship. So let's really take a look at what that is. What are we talking about when we talk about worship? And I want you to know as we get started, first and foremost, that your view of God makes all the difference in how you approach worship. How you see God, what you see when you think of God, it makes all the difference in your posture of worship. It makes all the difference in your enthusiasm for worship. It makes all the difference in your commitment to worship. It makes all the difference in your enjoyment in worship. It all goes back to the view that you have of God. That is the foundation. So, I kind of just want to ask you right now, what do you see when you see God? When you close your eyes, and I don't know, maybe you, you have a visual Maybe a visual comes to mind when you close your eyes and, and you think of God. Maybe He's bright light, high and lifted up, smoke, angels falling down, worshiping Him, a throne. I don't know. What, what visual do you see when you see God? Maybe it's not even so much a visual as it is just a, a feeling. What do you feel when you feel God's presence? Maybe it's some truths that come to mind when you think of who God is. Some actions, things that God has done and that you expect Him to do in the future. What, what is your view of God? Makes all the difference in how you approach worship. I think some of the most in, interesting encounters in all the Bible are people who by all rights were what we called experienced worshipers, people that knew God, had walked with God for years and years and years. But, but you have these encounters written down in the Bible of people like that who actually came face to face with God, had a moment in which they saw God and saw God's glory in a way that they had never seen God's glory before. And in those moments, it's, it's so incredibly interesting to me, they are completely undone. Nothing in their life could have prepared them for this moment. When they actually see God as He is, they'd known Him for years. They'd been talking about Him, preaching Him for years, worshiping Him for years. But, but when they came into His presence, they were completely undone. Ezekiel chapter 1 Ezekiel says that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. Ezekiel spends an entire chapter just straining the limits of language trying to explain to you what he saw. And it's just, it's so, it's cool to me to read how he just trips over his words trying to find the words to tell you what he saw. It was like fire and it was like rainbows and it was like more fire and it was like gleaming metal and, and he's just, he's sapphire. All these words, they're just straining to explain what he saw when he saw God. And he said, when I saw it, I fell on my face. 
Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And do you know the first thing that occurred to Isaiah when he saw God and when he recognized where he was? He said, Woe to me. Woe to me. I am undone. I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I don't know if you've ever had what we call the naked dream. If you ever had that dream where you're just kind of going about your business in your dream and then all of a sudden you realize I'm in a classroom, I'm in church, I'm in public, and I have no clothes on. I don't know if you've ever had that dream. It's very common. This is like the naked dream times a thousand where all my insecurities, all my weaknesses, my, my soul laid bare, I recognize all of a sudden I'm in the, I'm in the presence of power. Holy, holiness, righteousness, pure righteousness, and I'm undone. I have no, all my greatest fears that this part of me might be exposed. They might see this. They might know this. It's all laid bare in the presence of God. And Isaiah just crumples. He crumples. I'm undone. Even the meek and lowly Jesus. You might think, well, if I saw Jesus on the street, I mean, he's, he's my buddy. He's my friend. John saw him in all his glory. Revelation chapter 1 and he says, I fell at his feet as though dead. Job begged for an audience with God. All throughout the book of Job, we might even say, demanded an audience with God. And when he finally got one, God was halfway done before Job says, I cover my mouth. I have nothing to say. Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration, they heard God's voice from a cloud. They fell on their faces, Matthew says, and they were terrified. I want you to just right now imagine entering into the glorious throne room of God. And I want you to know that no matter else, how else it might go, I don't know what He has to say to you, I don't know what y'all have to talk about, but I know this, that your knees would fail you. That there would be no words adequate to express. You, you would bring nothing, nothing to bring, no excuses, no reasons, nothing impressive to show God. In His presence there is only reverence and awe for the wonder of the sight of His glory. That is what it's like in God's presence. And worship, worship now is seeing Him as He is and proclaiming His worthiness. That's what worship is. That's what the word actually means. Worship, it comes from an older English word, worthship. It's proclaiming His worth. He is worthy. That's what worship means. And you truly must have an accurate view of God, or else there will always be something diluting your worship, or perverting your worship. If you don't have a clear view of God, you're not going to purely worship Him. There might be something bad going on in your life. And you might say, I just, I don't feel like worship today. How could God expect me to worship on a day like today? I don't, have you ever felt like that before? I just felt bummed. Like, you know, I, just, I don't feel like going to church today. I mean, just all this junk that's happened to me. Or if you turn it on the radio and you have one of two options, you know, usually I listen to K-Love. I just don't feel like Jesus songs today. It's just not that kind of a day. If you just ever felt bad and, and like that meant that I just don't feel like worship. Or, or maybe there's this, a lot of people today have God on trial. How could I worship a God that allows so much pain and violence in this world? If He's so powerful, how does He let that go on? How could He be worthy of my worship? Or there's this, I've just got so much going on in my life right now. God would understand if I'm not here to worship Him. I'm, I'm just so busy. I don't have time. But I'll be back around to it. I'll be back once I have time for it. I want you to realize that Job wasn't just one of the worst circumstances you could ever imagine. Lost his kids. Lost his possessions. Lost his health. He's sitting in a pile of pus and ashes. But when he saw God, he shut his mouth. He repented and he worshiped. Because when we see God as He is, the only thing that makes sense is worship. Everything else is trivial. There's nothing more pressing going on when I see God as God is. The world drops away and I just worship. And it actually transforms me. 
What is worship? Worship is seeing God as He is and proclaiming His worth. Why should I worship? Why should I worship? Well, this is very interesting. The truth is that you are already worshiping something. Everyone. Everyone is already worshiping something. And it is the object of your worship that molds you into who you are. Everyone is worshiping something. There's plenty of people today that would say, no, that's false. That's not true. I'm not religious. I'm an atheist. I don't worship anything. There's many people that say there, there, there's worshipers and there's non-worshippers. That is, that's not true. That's not true now. The truth is that everyone ascribes ultimate value to something. Everyone's put something on a pedestal. They, they don't think they're religious. They don't worship. But, but they do think something is most important in life. Everyone's life is controlled, oriented around something to which they have ascribed ultimate value. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, the world is not simply divided into people who worship and people who don't. The world is divided into people who worship things that will distort your life and people who worship the only God who won't. That's the dividing line. You're going to worship something. The question is, is that something going to distort your life? Or is it actually going to make your life whole? Everyone ascribes ultimate value to something. Whether consciously or subconsciously, we, we all know there's something that I can't live without. We can call it that. Everyone has some sense of a magical answer to life. That if I had that, or if I achieved that, or if only this would happen, if only this would get out of the way, then I would be fulfilled. That thing, that's the thing that I have ascribed value to. And whatever that thing is, that is the object of your worship. It changes from person to person. Some people it's money. Or resources or possessions or the security that money buys, whatever you want to call it. For some people the ultimate value in life is my stuff. The things that are taking care of me, whatever you want to call it. For some people it's the acceptance of others. I must have it. I can't not have it. The acceptance of others. For some people it's success and achievement. For some people it is relationships. It changes from person to person, but it's the same story every time. Whatever has ultimate value in your life is your object of worship. And it controls your life, and your life becomes oriented around it. Whenever that thing is threatened, you will run to its rescue. Whenever that thing is threatened, that will pull your strings. People don't like me anymore. I must jump into action and save my acceptance and my uh, public opinion. When it's time to choose how to spend your time, this thing is always going to take priority in your schedule. If anything contradicts this thing, it will eventually lose out. There is no need that is greater. There is nothing more terrifying than losing this thing. This thing is your God. It is God. You're going to worship something. The only question is, what? What will I worship? And the thing is that there is only one God that you were made to worship. There is only one puzzle piece that fits with you. There's only one thing, one God that you were made to worship. And every other small g God will distort you when you worship it. I don't have to tell you this. Take a look at the people in your life that you kind of have a sense they've made money the God of their life. That's the ultimate value in their life. Does that seem to be working for them? You would think if money was your God you would feel good about money. But generally no. The people that make money their God feel terrible about money. They're afraid and they're fearful about losing money. They're not generous people. They're not good with their money. They're stingy. You look at them and you have this sense that they are less alive, less human, less free when it comes to money because money has become their God and therefore their slave master. For those people that worship what other people think of them, do you see how they are slaves to public opinion? Do you see how they are not free to be who they truly are? They can't show everything of who they are, otherwise you might reject them. They are a slave. Go down the list and I promise you every God but one, every God but one, when you worship it, you will have less life. You will be less human. You will be less free. They distort your soul. 
Only when you worship the one true God will He give you life. Only He is the God who heals you when you worship Him. He's the only God that needs nothing from you. The God of money needs something from you. The God of public opinion needs something from you. This God is the only God who needs nothing from you, who forgives you and gives you His grace, who freely gives you life, who restores your soul. The more and more you pour your worship into this God, the more you find yourself fulfilled and free and alive. Only when you ascribe ultimate value to this God do you find that this God ascribes value to you in return. Only our God. Only the one true God. So why worship? Well, the fact is you're already worshiping. There, there's no why to it. You're going to. Why worship God? That's the question. And the answer is that every other God will twist you up into slavery and will steal your life, will break you. Only this God is worthy. Only this God loves you. Only this God tells you. He commands you to worship. Why? Because He knows that worship will actually heal you and give you life. I hope what we're seeing here is that worship is absolutely critical. Not just to this worship hour, but to the, the whole picture of your life. Every facet of your life is defined by your worship. You are defined by worship. Depending on what you worship, it's either going to enslave us or fill us with life. And, and for that reason, I think it's very important to close in this way, how do we do it? It's, it's critically important, so we want to do it well. How can we worship? How can we worship well? And I just want to give you four cornerstones, four touch points that are very important to how we worship. Number one, it's critically important that we worship in community. In community. Now, I don't want to downplay the importance of individual worship, of, of raising up an altar everywhere across your life, in the laundry room, in your garden. Uh, there, there's all sorts of facets of your life, and every single one, one of them needs to have an altar to God in it. But you need to know this morning that you were created to belong to a worshiping community. There's a measure of God's presence that you will only know in a worshiping community community. C.S. Lewis once illustrated it. Uh, I don't even think he was talking towards this topic, but I think his illustration was perfect for it when he talks about this relationship between three friends, Jack, Charles, and Ronald. They had great friendship. They know each other well. They spent much time together until the day that Charles died. And Jack thought, well, this is bad. Uh, we've lost something here. But maybe also I've gained something. Maybe my relationship with Ronald would be closer. After all, now I have him all to myself. But as the years went by, he realized something tragic. That there were pieces of Ronald that only Charles knew how to draw out. He came to realize, I will never see Ronald laugh at one of Charles' jokes again. That there were, there's parts of Ronald that only Charles knew how to activate and he came to realize that instead of having more Ronald now, he would forever have less Ronald. If you want to take God out of the worshiping community to have Him all to yourself, you're going to lose something. I, I just I have to tell you that you're going to have less God, not more of God. It's only in community that you will see God most fully as He is. You understand that? It's only in community that you're going to see the most of God that you possibly could see. There's a side of God that I only see through Bart, or, or when I hear Daphne talking, or, or, or when I'm with Wes. You understand, if, if I was to lose Wes, I'd lose something of God Himself. Because it's in community that we see all the facets and we see God in each other and the ways that we draw out parts of God. I, I loved a couple weeks ago sitting down and, and Luke leading the Lord's Supper and it hit me in that moment. I've not observed the Lord's Supper in this way in quite a while. Why? Because I've been leading the Lord's Supper and, and, and that's good, that's, that's fine, but we each draw out something that each other needs to see of God. So, we worship in community, and the more diverse the community, the, the better it is. We see all of Him, and we proclaim His worth. We worship in community. Number two, it's critical that we worship in truth. 
You may recall from John chapter 4, Jesus told the Samaritan woman that God must be worshipped in truth. We read from Psalm 95 just a moment ago, and I just want to remind you, the psalmist said, Let's worship, come, let's sing with joy to the Lord, let's shout aloud to the rock of our salvation, let us come before Him with thanksgiving. Why? Why should we worship? Listen to what he says in verse 3, 4, For the Lord is, the Lord is a great God. He is a great King above all gods. He owns the mountains, the depths, the sea, the land. He made these things. He said, let's go worship. And, and why should we go worship? Because I feel inspired. Because I, I feel like God is a good God. Uh, because it will be psychologically helpful to us if we worship. No. No, we worship Him because of the truth of who He is and what He has done. You see what the psalmist is doing here. He is submitting to believe all that the prophets have said about God. The prophets said that God is the great King above all gods. The prophets said that God made the sea and the mountains and He owns all these things. And He has submitted Himself to believe the truth that He finds in the Bible, in the Scriptures, in the traditions of the people of God. And He submitted, I will believe those things. Let me tell you why this is important. If we don't submit to believe the Bible's truth about God, we have no foundation from which to worship God. It can't be done. And there are people today who try to do this. They say, I want to worship God, but I, I don't feel like I believe all that the Bible says about sexual ethics. I want to worship this God, but I, I don't believe all that the Bible has to say about women. That's, that's archaic. I don't believe all that the Bible has to say about there being only one way and that being in Jesus Christ. And you end up worshiping a God that you craft according to your individual beliefs. I'm here to tell you, you can craft that individual God if you really, really want to. But I promise you, you can never worship that God. You can't worship it. Because what you have there is a God that cannot contradict you. You have a God that can't teach you anything new. A God that is ultimately no more powerful than you are. You have a God that is not of ultimate value and therefore cannot be worshipped. You'll always know that it's a sham. You'll always know that you don't have a God that's worthy. So it's critical that we submit ourselves to a body of truth that is higher than us, that can contradict us, and, and can stand over us. We must worship in truth. Also back to John 4, number 3, it's critical that we worship according to Spirit, in the Spirit. Jesus says that God is a Spirit, and those, those that worship Him must worship Him in Spirit and in truth. We must worship in truth. We must also worship in Spirit. Now, I've heard that verse read many times before, according to maybe our modern understanding of what spirit means. Uh, to be spirited, to be emotional, to be animated, to be energetic. That's, that's sort of how I've heard this verse read before. You must worship according to truth. That means all the things that are true about God. And then also bring some energy to it and be happy about it and emotionally activated on all these things in spirit. That, that's fine. We do need to bring all of our energies into worship. But I'm here to tell you when the Bible talks about being spiritual, or doing something in spirit, it means something more specific than that. It means doing something in connection with the Holy Spirit of God. To worship in spirit means that we worship in the presence of and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is something that you can neither generate nor control. It is a characteristic of those who wait in submission. Those who are in spirit, they wait upon the Lord in submission to the Lord. I can't tell the Spirit to come. I can't tell the Spirit what to do. I can draw nearer to God, and I can gather in His truth, and I can turn my will over to His way. I can invite Him. Now we, we need to invite Him to come into us and to use us. But God sends the, the Spirit as He wills, where He wills, when He wills. 
He alone knows the doors that He will open and which He will close. He, he alone knows who He will empower for which great works and how particularly He will raise up His people and which moments are the, the right times to do the right things. Jesus tells John uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, He says, the Spirit is it's sort of like the wind. You hear it? You see its effects? You see it rustle the leaves here and rustle the leaves there, but you do not know where it came from. You don't know where it's going next. I've heard it said that the skilled worshipers are kind of like skilled sailors. They, they don't make the wind, but they're ready for the wind. They wait on the wind, and when the wind comes, they, they, they are ready for it. They've anticipated it, and they know how to be furthered by it. That's what it's like to worship in spirit. To have a keen eye for recognizing the Spirit of God, standing ready to respond and submit to it. And so we worship in spirit, inviting the presence of God with submissive readiness and expecting and anticipating Him. Fourthly, lastly, it's critical that we worship from a place of rest. A place of rest. This is very important. I think it's extremely telling that from the very beginning, the concepts of rest and worship have been intertwined and married within the institution of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of worship. The Sabbath is a day of rest. Worship is not the achievement of my works. Worship is the celebration of His divine work. You cannot worship. You cannot worship if your mindset is a striving for approval. Why am I here today? Why are you here today? Is it because I'm here to gain the approval of God? Or because I feel as though I would be rejected if I was not here? Is it here because, am I here because I'm, I'm checking off the box that proves that I'm worthy to go to heaven? Proves to God and proves to myself that I'm worthy? If you came here this morning to appease and to earn favor with your God, you did not come to worship the one true God of heaven. Because that's not this God. The one true God of heaven died on the cross in His supreme love for you with a final word that settles everything. It is finished. It's finished. The work is finished. The work is done. He invites you now to Sabbath worship, a deep, peaceful rest in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ. We came here this morning to proclaim the worthiness of Jesus Christ who set us free. But you cannot truly praise until you truly receive grace. You can't do it as a work. It does not work. We rest in Him and true worship will find us. If you would please pray with me. Father God, we are in awe, absolute awe of Your presence. And Father, we repent and confess that we are all too often slow to see it. All too often slow to see Your presence in our midst, in the car ride, in our home, in our workplace, in the grocery store. Father, You are so near. By the blood of Jesus, Your Holy Spirit has come to live in us. We are now the temple in which You live, and we all too often do not recognize Your presence. Father, I pray that You would open our eyes. Open our eyes to see You, to see the truth of who You are, to see the truth of what You have done, to know You to know You intimately and to submit to being known, to open up our souls vulnerably, humbly, and to invite You in to know us. We pray that You would lead us into more of Your presence. And Father, we know, we know that You alone are worthy. Father, we pray that You would Call us and bring us in to know You more deeply. And the more and more we know You, the more and more we will be assured that You are worthy. And our lives will respond accordingly. That worship of You is the only thing. The only thing. Everything that we do, help us to do it in a spirit of worship. And Father, I pray that, that You would create that spirit of worship here in this place. 
that we would come together and be strengthened and that we would, we would be a house of praise that draws in worshipers and that you would send us out from this place drawing in worshipers. Father, we pray that this, this community would be a, a worshiping community, that you would be honored, that the truth of your worthiness would be proclaimed in all places here in our community. Father, we know that, that as we draw near in worship, you will transform us and we pray we pray for your work that you would transform us. Father, we're so grateful. We're so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful for your acceptance and the price that you paid that we could stand this close, that we would be this near to you now and for all eternity. And Father, we as a church family now pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.